everyone welcome back in this final example for this week we're going to do one more demo this time we're going to focus on a slightly more advanced concept in p5 play called groups uh, with groups we're going to be able to think of these sprite objects as more of a collection or a group and we'll be able to sort of apply behaviors to all of them um, it's a really really cool feature uh, that we're going to explore some more when we get into more actual specific game examples uh, but today we just want to start to introduce the idea um, so let's get our sketch started here uh, we'll make a new canvas again we're working with p5 play so we want to be using this canvas object so it's just a slightly different way to create the drawing area and like we did in the previous example i already went ahead and included right because it's a library that we're bringing in i've included um, the two scripts that we need for p5 play jump back into our sketch here okay and uh, we'll set a black background for this one and then here we go okay so what we're going to do in this demo is we're going to create um, kind of like these sparks um, this this fun little sparks fireworks behavior and we're going to leverage the group concept to do that okay? so let's start by making a variable uh, we're going to call it sparks and uh, groups are going to be very much like arrays in uh, just kind of vanilla p5 or a basic javascript in the sense that they're going to represent a collection of objects um, but p5 play has a very kind of interesting unique way of handling groups so let's see how groups work um, so <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and create sparks we're going to say make a new group okay. and the idea here is that any attribute that we set on the group object is going to automatically get gets transferred, gets transmitted to actual instances of that group, okay? So for example, uh, after we've made a group here, we could say sparks, uh, we could make an, an individual instance of a spark. Maybe let's go in and put in uh, mouse pressed here. Um, or we could say, instead of mouse pressed, let's use the, the P5 play input style. So we'll say if mouse pressed, and um, <clears throat> let's go and do this okay so we'll say uh or if mouse pressed okay uh we're gonna say sp new sparks dot sprite so this is gonna say take our sparks group and then add a sprite to it okay and we don't we can put it into a variable or not it doesn't matter here so we'll just say new we don't really care about having a reference to that variable. Okay. So now every time I'm going to press the mouse, this is going to make a new sprite from this Sparks group. Okay. So let's see how this group mechanism works. Okay. So for example, um, we're going to say, okay, all, uh, all the objects we make from the group are gonna have a diameter of 10 instead of just being this default. Okay. Say, so, okay, now we have a diameter of 10. Uh, and then we can see now they're not getting pushed off as much. Uh, let's add uh, some gravity. Um, so let's let's go a little larger than 10. And let's say world.gravity.y is going to be equal to 5, let's say. So now every time we make new objects from this Sparks group, right, they all have the same um, attributes. Okay. Now, one thing that's kind of cool with the, the group feature is we could say okay we could we could create these attributes and we can make them um, dynamic okay and here's what i mean by that so for example if we wanted to every time we make a new spark okay we could say uh, let's put it into a variable here if let's say we wanted that spark to appear at the mouse location we could create a new sprite using the sparks group so that it would have the attributes of the spark right now it's just a diameter of 20. Um, and then we could say s.x equals mouse.x, s.y equals mouse.y. We're going to use the mouse object instead of the p5 built in. So now we can make sparks that follow the mouse. Okay. Um, but what I want to do here is just show you another way that we can do this using the group uh, feature. Okay. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to set the attributes of the sparks uh, group. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, the x coordinate, let's start with x, um, is going to be equal to a function. So instead of being an, a fixed number, like, you know, centered in the window so that every spark would have, you know, the same 
the same x coordinate, um, we're going to make that equal to a function, which means its value is going to be dynamic. Every time we make a new spark, that function is going to return a different value. So for example, we could say, let's make a function here called, um, actually, we're going to make it up here so it's closer. We're going to make a function called um, get mouse x. Okay? And this is going to return the value, the x value of the mouse coordinate. If you haven't seen this keyword before, whenever you're inside a function, if you use the keyword return, it just means that this function will output a number that can then be captured and put into a value. So here we'll say get mouse x, okay? but we're not going to put the parentheses. Because okay? if I put the parentheses, what's going to happen is that it's going to set the value immediately, right? So it's going to be mouse x is going to be equal to zero. So all of my sparks are I have an x value of zero because at the beginning of the sketch, the mouse x value was zero. My cursor was not in the window. Instead, we're just going to say make this x property of the Sparks group, make it a dynamic property by using just making it equal to the function itself. Okay? So I'm not making it equal to the return value of the function, which is what would happen if I put parentheses. Here I'm going to say actually this x value is going to get determine using the get mouse x function while the program is running when I make a new spark. So now when I make a new spark, right, you can see that it's getting its mouse x value from this function. Now we could do the same thing for y. Okay, we could go in and make a function called get mouse y and then have it return the mouse value. But there is a, a really cool little bit of syntax we can use in combination with this idea that some of the group attributes can be dynamic, um, it's going to be taking advantage of JavaScript's um, arrow functions. Okay? So this is what the syntax looks like. We're going to say, instead of writing a separate function like this, get mouse x, and then we have a function below that we've made that returns the value of where the mouse is, we're going to use um, a simpler uh, syntax, simpler in quotes, just more immediate, we're going to use the arrow function syntax. So we're going to say y equals parentheses, then we'll put this equal and then greater than sign. So that becomes kind of like a little arrow. That's why it's called the arrow functions. And then on the right side of the arrow, we can put something that's going to be, that's going to be a, a value that's going to become the return value of a function. So here I could say mouse.y, for example. So this is equivalent to building a separate function that's going to return mouse.x, as we're doing up here. Here we're using a more kind of concise syntax to do this. We're basically saying that y value of the sparks group right, is going to be a function. That's why the parentheses. And then this is going to use the arrow setter to say this is going to be a value that gets checked every time the, the, the new sparks are being created. So if we run this, we'll be able to see that the y value that we get is in fact wherever the mouse happens to be at runtime, okay? not just in setup here at the beginning. So we did it like this just to show you that this is what's happening. We're saying the x attribute is going to get determined by the outcome of a function, right? get mouse x. Or if our function again is very simple and just fits in a single line, we can simplify by just using this shortcut syntax. We could say mouse.x. Okay. And then we don't really need to write a separate function every time. So it just makes life a little bit easier. So this is cool because now we're creating these Spark objects later on in draw. But then in setup, we just kind of gave them, gave these attributes of our group. We made them these kind of like dynamic properties, right? So they're going to be, uh, and we can apply this to other things. For example, um, if we wanted to say sparks velocity.x, right? We wanted to make their speed be random, right? So we, if, let's say we gave them all a velocity x of one, then every spark would just kind of go a little bit to the right. And then of course we have gravity, so they fall down, okay? But instead we're gonna make this a little bit more interesting. We'll say, let's make this an arrow setter function. And we'll say, this is gonna be randomized between minus five and five. So now our sparks, can go left or right. Okay. So this is a cool little bit of syntax. So instead of setting the attribute to a fixed number 
right? Like we're doing here, every diameter equals 20. It means every velocity x equals the outcome of this function, basically. We can do the same with velocity y. Let's make them random between minus 5 and 5. Again, we could have also done this down here. When we made a new Spark object, we could have gone in here, and then we could have set its attributes. Okay? But this allows us to simply say, just make a new Spark that belongs to this group here, a new Sprite that belongs to this Sparks group, and automatically its attributes will get set because we configured the group to do that. So it's a very cool feature of, uh, of P5Play that we can leverage groups to do this. <clears throat> All right, so let's add a few more things here uh, just to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, for starters, uh, we can say, okay, well, maybe these, uh, these Spark objects, right, these, uh, these sprites here that come from my Sparks group, um, we don't want them to, we want them to have a, a shorter lifespan. So we said that automatically when objects fall way far off screen, they automatically get deleted. That's one of the things that P5 Play does. Um, the other way that we can limit an object's lifespan is we can set its life attribute. Okay? So we could say, for example, the life attribute of a spark might be 30. Okay? So that means the spark object is going to only live for 30 frames. Okay? So it has its life is calculated in number of frames rendered. Okay? Or we could, uh, we could randomize this value. Again, we could use our dynamic arrow setter function syntax to say when we create a new, ob a new sprite using this group, its life will be determined using a function and the result will be maybe something between, uh, I don't know, 30 and 100. So that now they have some slightly different um, attributes. Okay. Very cool. Now we could also say um, something like maybe the uh, the color, the fill color, is going to be equal to another function that we set. Maybe we make, and then again we could say let's make a, a color palette up here. This palette maybe we'll make it simple: uh, yellow, orange, red. Okay, because we're making these uh, these sparks. And then we will say, pick a random color for the sparks. So instead of having a fixed color, um, we're going to make it equal to random. And I misspelled my group name here. Let's hit play. So now instead of having totally random colors, which is the default, I'm getting some colors from my uh, three choices that I've put up here. right? And I can select randomly from an array by feeding an array to the random function. Pretty neat. Okay. And then another cool thing we can do is the group has an attribute, an attribute called amount. Okay, so amount is really cool. If we set amount to something, let's say we go in the beginning here and we say amount equals 100. What the group is going to do is going to say, okay, let me make sure, let me try, let me fill up the number of sprites from this group until I have 100 automatically. So here you can see at the top, this created 100 um, of these sprite objects right? from my Spark group at the beginning. And then they all just went their separate ways. Then if I press, it's going to create more. Okay? So what we could do is we could use this amount attribute whenever we want to. For example, uh, instead of making one Spark whenever I press the mouse, we could say group. Right. Go check the amount, and if we have less than a hundred, go and make a hundred. Okay. So now we can press, and then this is making a whole bunch of sprites at once. Okay. Or maybe we'll uh, yeah we can leave it to a hundred. Okay. <clears throat> now because the sprites are colliding with each other, right? It's doing the same thing as it did in the First example we looked at where um, the objects kind of spread themselves out. We'll get to that in a second. But this is another cool feature of the, the group object in P5. Right? We can use the amount property to automatically get P5 to create enough object until you reach that amount to kind of fill the group up automatically. So we don't have to do any kind of for loop here. 
All of that is taken care of behind the scenes for us by this group object in P5 play. Or uh, instead of um, just pressing, I could all, instead of just on clicks, I could say pressing here. That's another um, way that we can interact with the mouse. And then as I drag my mouse here, it's going to keep making more, except for like that very first burst. Right. It's going to keep making more objects because, again, their lifetime is between 30 and 100, right? So some of them will die quicker than others. Right? Then uh, as I drag my mouse, I can keep making some of these uh, objects. And then as their life runs out, they disappear. So pretty neat. All right. Now let's, uh, let's refine this a little bit just to make it look uh, a little bit more nice. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, we're going to first, we're going to get rid of the stroke. Now, one thing that... Maybe there's a better way to do this, but I cannot figure out a way to tell my P5 sprite objects to have no stroke. Okay. So my work around this is simply to um, make the stroke value equal to uh, a color, right? Which is going to be, let's say we're going to make it black with an alpha value of zero. Okay. So this is a zero opacity. And uh, it kind of seems like a bit of a waste, but so because it's still drawing a stroke, but it's now invisible. Uh, so that's how I figured out how I could disable the stroke. Um, if somebody finds a better way to turn off the stroke in P5 Play, please let me know. So we'll just make a transparent stroke, and that's the effect right here. Um, the other thing we're going to do is we're going to say, let's take a look at the life of our sparks. Okay, And as their life runs out, we're going to make them uh, more and more dim. Okay, so we're going to go and change their color, right? So right now they have different colors. We're going to change the alpha level until they just kind of disappear as they fade out and they run out of life. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to do this inside draw. Now, another attribute of the group is that it basically behaves just like an array. Okay, so inside this sparks variable, because we made it a group, this is, in fact, an array that contains all of the active sprite objects that are contained within that group. So if we wanted to do something to them over time, like let's say animate their alpha value based on their life attribute, we could write a for loop right? that would iterate over this array. So we're going to use the shorthand syntax here because it contains objects. So we'll say for every s of sparks, and then s here is going to be my variable that I'm going to be able to use as the loop repeats uh, to access each of my sprite objects inside this array sparks. Okay. Um, let's do something with our, with these objects. So for instance, we could say, okay, well, we have the, the, the sprite has a fill color. And then we'll say, this is a, this is a P5 color object. So we're going to set the alpha value of that color to um, an opacity. So let's let's measure the opacity. So we'll say, let's map the life of our spark, okay, s dot life. We're going to map its life. So we said life could be random between 30 and 100. So the range of life is 0 to 100. We're going to map this to a number between 0 and 255. And then we'll use that number as our opacity for the fill color of our sprite. Or instead of, I could have written here a uh, sprite, okay? But I'm just using S for short. So S here just means it gives me a handle on each successive object inside the Sparks array. So now when I create the objects, right, I can go into draw and I can say, as the program runs, check their life, right? Check their life and then map that value to a new value between 0 and 255. And then we're, I'm using this as the transparency for my fill color. Okay. So pretty cool trick. Very neat. Now again, these sprite objects, they're just like regular sprites in the, um, in the physics simulated world. You can see that they're like bumping into each other, right? They're falling down. They're being affected by gravity. Uh, if I was to add here smack in the middle of the screen, maybe in uh, in setup here, we're going to go and make a, let's make a, a variable, a new sprite. Okay, I'm going to call this a block and the block um, 
fill will be black, block.stroke will be white, block.width, we'll just put a big block smack in the middle and we're going to make it static. Okay, we'll make a static block right in the middle of our screen here, right? You can see that my, my sparks, right, they interact with this block and they will bounce off of it. Uh, we could maybe set their bounciness to be a little bit more fun. Let's try that. We'll set the bounciness to uh, maybe a fixed number, 0 0.5. Let's see what that gives us. Ooh, they just like explode now. And they will bounce off this uh, <clears throat> this block a little bit better, right? So objects that come from a group, they're just sprites. The group objects in P5 just becomes kind of a, a way to manage groups. And it allows us to create attributes that will apply to the whole group. And these attributes can be fixed values like this, or they can be dynamic values like this when we use this special syntax with the arrow setter. Okay, so just get used to that syntax. It allows us to put something to the right of the arrow, which is a dynamic value. This could be a variable. This could be the result of a function, right? Like random here. Um, so this way, as we make more objects, we can automatically get the group to make more objects for us. Um, these objects get created using the rules that we set up at the beginning for this group. So it's very, very cool. We don't have to do a lot of code here just to get this awesome little Sparks simulator going, just leveraging the cap capabilities of the group. Um, we'll do one final thing before we wrap up this example, um, is the idea that uh, we can also use the group to kind of apply check for collisions between objects, right? Between objects either in the group and in the scene. So we could say if we wanted to set a collision function between sparks collides, right? With uh, the block, we could do that. Of course, we'd have to do it after we define the block. Uh, but here we're gonna use the uh, kind of the opposite of a collision in P5, which is something called an overlap, okay? Uh, let's go look at Sprite and we're gonna look at overlaps. Okay? So overlap basically allows you to have sprites that can overlap each other. Whereas normally in the physics engine, right? If you, if you have two sprites, the physics engine will try to keep those apart and they will bump into each other. If you tell the physics engine that two sprites should be able to overlap, they essentially will get, um, they will not affect each other from the physics perspective, but they will still be impacted by the other objects in the game okay, or in the environment. So what we can do with the, the group is we could say sparks, okay? Spark is going to overlap with other sparks. Okay, we can write this kind of crazy cool syntax. We'll say spark.overlap with every other sparks. And now you'll see how this changes the behavior of our sparks. Okay. So they are now bouncing off my block here, but they're no longer bouncing off each other. So that's kind of a cool feature as well. So we can we can use, we can talk to groups the same way we would talk to individual uh, sprites, essentially. It just means that the group object now speaks for the entire group. Very neat. Um, let's make these a little smaller maybe, so they look more like little sparks. Uh, and now every time I drag my mouse around, right, I can, cr I'm creating up to 100. Right, so this line here will make sure that the amount gets topped up until it reaches 100. The sparks die off over time because of their life value, right? Their life being randomized. They don't overlap with one another because uh, I've, or they don't, they don't collide with one another because I've told the group that it's okay to overlap with other members of that group, uh, but they still collide with this um, sprite I dumped in the middle of the sketch here just for demonstration purposes. Okay. All right. So this is groups in P5 Play. Uh, we're going to try to leverage this down the road when we create more structured games examples. Um, so that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed these tutorials. I will see you next time.